And he's coming soon. He's coming soon. We're well, right in the middle of our Bible reading. I had one of those preacher coughing spells and I had to walk out of our room for a few minutes. So that's, I know a lot of you have been wondering why is the preacher bringing a cup of water with him to the pulpit. Well, I do that because if I begin to cough, I want to have something to stop it. And uh, I, years ago, I used to set my water on my pulpit and I used to make all kind of movements with my hands and I baptized the first two rows with a cup of water <laughs> one Sunday morning. And so I, uh, I decided it might not be a good thing to set water up here with, if I get to moving around too much. Uh, turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1 and I'm going to read one verse of Scripture in your hearing. And we'll talk about this verse of Scripture for just a moment before we uh, get into our monthly business meeting. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. Just a few words recorded there. And the Bible says there, And to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness. And that's what I want to talk to you about for just a moment uh, this evening is godliness. I want to talk to you about godliness. Seeing the unseen. Seeing the unseen. Let's pray. Father, uh, help us to see you in this. And teach us, Lord, uh, those things that we need to know about godly living. For without you, we cannot live godly. So show us those things that we need to know in this study. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know whether you realize it or not, but there is a religion that basically tells you that you can graduate and be a God. Did you know that? There is a religion that tells you that you can graduate and be a God. Now, that would sound very good to somebody that was trying to seek position. But you need to understand that there's just one God. There's just one God. And there's no way that you and I will ever get to be a God. But yet and still with that being said, we can learn how to live godly lives. Now, we Baptists teach that the Lord takes up residence in us by His Holy Spirit when we're saved by the grace of God. That does not make us a God. It just lets us know that God has taken up residence in us to help us to live the kind of godly lives that He would have for us to live. And when you get saved by the grace of God, I want to assure you that you'll not do anything wrong that the Holy Spirit of God don't come knocking on your door and letting you know without a shadow of a doubt that you're doing something wrong. The Bible teaches us that we are to live godly in Christ Jesus but whenever I begin to think about the terminology that we use there by asking uh, this question, what does it mean to be godly? Well, I expect that if I were to start with Nancy and just go all the way around to Michael, that we would get several, many different answers. But I'm going to do my best to try to tell you and to show you what it really means to be godly. 
The first thing that I want you to see in this, this evening, is the definition. So let's look at the definition of godly. Now to be godly is not necessarily to be God-like. And I want to make that very clear. To be godly is not necessarily to be God-like. Even though they were called Christians first at Antioch, because they were acting like the Lord Jesus Christ. When I preach what do you mean, it's not exactly trying to be God-like. Well, I want to tell you something. It's impossible for you to be God-like. It is an impossible task for you to be God-like. Now, what are you talking about, preacher? The only way that you could ever be God-like is if you had a divine nature and there's nothing... Hey, now, I love all of you. <laughs> I love all of you. But when I look out there, I don't see nothing divine that I'm looking at. Amen. 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 And whenever I look in the mirror and I shave in the morning, I certainly don't see nothing that's very divine. So, to be, to be godlike would mean that you would have to possess a divine nature. And you don't possess that divine nature. But glory to God. <laughs> Whew, when Jesus dropped by and saved me by His marvelous grace, while I might not possess a divine nature, glory to God, a divine nature <laughs> possesses me. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, it's not even adequate to be like what God wants us to be like. I mean, there's no way that we can be like God wants us to be because we're sinners in need of a Savior. So what does it mean to be godly? I believe that what it really is saying here to be godly is to have a constant godly consciousness. Knowing that God is always near. A constant awareness of God. A continual consideration of God. I believe that this is probably given to us in its greatest example uh, in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter number 11, uh, verse 27. Hebrews eleven twenty-seven. Listen to what the Bible says there. The Bible says there, by faith, not by being like God, but by faith, by faith, Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Now notice what it says. It says for he endured as seeing Him who is invisible. You see, I believe when we reach a place in our life that God by His divine nature allows us to see in our spirit He who is invisible, it's then that we begin to have a God consciousness and it's then that we begin to understand what godliness is all about. I like what it says here. For He endured as seeing Him who is invisible. Now I've never looked into the face of Jesus. I've never been able to see God. Now Moses, the Bible said, saw the hinder part of God. And it said that whenever he came off the mountain after seeing the hinder part of God, that they had to put a veil on his face because his face was shining so brightly like the noonday sun that they could not even look at His appearance. I've never looked into the face of Jesus. Not in the physical sense. But oh my friend, 
I have been able to see Jesus in the spiritual sense. I've been able to see He who is invisible in the spiritual sense. Walk in the Spirit of the Lord and you'll see Jesus. My friend, to be godly is to have a God consciousness. To be godly is when you see something you know that's not right and you stir away from that that's not right. To be godly is to pick up the Bible and to read it and to understand that this is my roadmap for living. And it's not a set of do's and don'ts, but it tells me how I need to live my life to stay on track to godly living. The second thing that I want to share with you is not only a godly definition, but I want to give, you, give to you rather the details of godly living. The details. Now, we need to first of all, to understand to live godly, you've got to recognize the existence of God. Now, there's a lot of people in the world today that just don't believe that God exists. There, there really is. In fact, there's more in our country today than ever before that just doesn't believe that God truly exists. This morning in our Sunday school lesson, we learned that there are those who live among us, by the way, uh, who will tell you that Jesus was no more than a great prophet or a wonderful and marvelous religious figure or religious man. There are those who really don't believe that God, even those who believe that there is no God, will tell you that, hey, historically speaking, Jesus was a powerful religious figure. And they don't see Him as anything else. But for you to reach a place in your life that you're going to live godly, my friend, you've got to believe that there is a God. Amen. Now I want you to know that God has never tried to make Himself known to any man whatsoever. He wants men to accept Him by faith. He's never tried to prove that He is. Somebody says, well, how do we know that He is? Because the Bible says in the beginning, God created. And you see, we accept that by faith. That in the beginning, God created. I remember as a little boy asking my daddy this question. Well, daddy, how did God get there? And you want me to tell you what my daddy said to me? He was always there. He's always been there. And He'll always be there. Amen. You see, Daddy had accepted by faith that God is. And before you can live a godly life, you've got to accept the fact that God is. Now, I know that I'm preaching to the choir. Because when I look out there at all of you, I know your hearts. I know that you, like me, you've accepted God by faith. Listen, Hebrews 11.6, the Bible says, But without faith, without belief, without faith, it is impossible to please Him, to please God. For he that cometh to God, listen, must believe that He is. You can't be godly if you don't believe that He is. Amen? Amen There's just no way. Must believe that He is, and listen, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Now, I don't know about you, but I like that. I've already experienced some of those rewards. Yes, I 
<laughs> I, I think about when I pastored this church 30 years ago. My little office was right here in this little prayer room where we got a lot of stuff stored up that we need to store somewhere else where we can start using it as a prayer room again. Amen? Amen. It really, really was. And I remember Charlie McClellan's daughter Rose having surgery in Jacksonville at the Baptist Hospital. And I remember drawing my paycheck from Gordon Avenue Baptist Church 30 years ago. In fact, I think it was about the same thing that I'm making now 30 years ago. <laughs> hey, but that's all right. And I remember after paying my bills, I had just enough money to fill up my old gas drink in LTD Green Ford. <laughs> And I drove to Jacksonville, Florida to be with Mr. Charlie, Miss Betty, and Rose who was going to have some pretty major reconstructive surgery. And I remember coming back home that day. I kept, hey, my son David played hooky from school that day. I kept him out and took him with me to Jacksonville. That's a long time ago, so it won't do you no good to tell on him now. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we, we go to Jacksonville, we stay for the surgery, and after it's all over and things are going good, we stop by my brother's house who lived in Orange Park at that time. And we slept for about two hours, and then we got on the road and we came back home. And when I got back home... We had $10 in our pocket. $10. And I won't ever forget falling down on my knees by my bedside and saying, God, I don't know how I'm going to feed my family next week. And I had too much pride to come to the church and say, look, I need an advance or I need some help. I wasn't going to do that. I mean, I'm a prideful human being. I didn't want to do that. So I said, God, back then you can buy a roll of that old Winn-Dixie hamburger meat pretty cheap and a loaf of light bread and a 10-pound bag of potatoes for about $10. And I said, bless God, we'll eat potatoes and hamburger for a week. I said, but Lord, I'm trusting you. I'm just going to trust you. I come down here, I tried to spend a few hours every morning in that little office. Didn't always make it, but I tried to. I'm sitting at that desk, same desk that I got now, had it 30 years ago in that little office. That side door, Joe Edwards walks in the church. And he said, Preacher, he said, God woke me up at 3 o'clock this morning and told me that you needed some groceries. God told me that you had made that trip to Jacksonville and it took a little extra money for you this week. And the Lord told me to bring this check by to you. And I opened up Brother Joe's check and he had written me a check for $100. And I'd watch preachers take advantage of my dear old sweet granddaddy many times. And I looked at him and I said, Brother Joe, I can't take your $100. I said, this church takes care of me. And I said, I, I just can't do it. I said, I promised God I'd never do anything like that. And old Brother Joe Edwards, in his wisdom and his way of wisdom and his soft-toned voice, looked at me. Brother Joe never raised his voice. And I won't ever forget what he said. He said, young preacher. I was young back then. <laughs> young preacher. Did you not hear me say to you that the Lord woke me up at 3 o'clock this morning 
and told me to bring you this. I will not miss my blessing because of your stubbornness. And he laid the check on my desk and he walked out the door. That old man taught this preacher a lesson that day. Sometimes we miss God's blessing because of our own stubbornness. But I took that and I bought groceries for my family that week. Now you see, what I'm trying to say to you is that God is a rewarder to all who will diligently seek Him. But the key is knowing that He is. And knowing that He is the rewarder. Friend, He'll never bless you and you can never be godly if you don't really believe that He exists. And then there's the realization of the greatness of God. We don't have time to read all of Psalm 50, but Psalm 50 talks to us about the greatness of God. And, and verse 1 says that He's the mighty God. Our God is a mighty God. Even the Lord that has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. He is the mighty God. And then there's the subordination to the authority of God. Not voluntary placing oneself under another actual recognition of the superiority of another. You see, we've got to subject ourselves to God. We've got to surrender our all to Him. And when we don't surrender our all to Him, then we're not following Him. And then there's the submission to the direction of God. Where He leads me, I will follow. Where He leads me, I will follow. I'll go with Him, with Him all the way. We've got to follow His direction. We've got to do what He says at all times. All times. And listen, we've got to do what He says cheerfully without complaining. But you see, most of us complain. I'll be honest with you, I'm a complainer. Now some of you looking at, real, at me real spiritual like you hadn't ever complained before. I, I, I see that. I can be a complainer. Uh, especially whenever my little wife says, come on, we're going to go do this in the yard. I can complain real big. Honey, I don't feel like doing that today. Yeah, but come on, we're going to do it anyway. But you see, sometimes we complain to God. And we don't want to do the things that God tells us to do. And then there's the tribute to the glory of God. A life filled with His glory. How do, how do I have a life filled with His glory? Well, first of all, you've got to have conversion. If I confess my sins, He's faithful and just to forgive me my sins and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. You've got to have a conversion experience. And once you have a conversion experience, then there's going to be a change. There's going to be a change of conduct. Let me tell you something. When I got saved by the grace of God, I was 15 years old. I got saved on a Thursday night in front of a television set. I didn't let a whole lot of folks know it Friday because I was still kind of letting the Spirit of God, He was still, he was still working on me, all right? And He's still working on me. <laughs> hey. I'm 61 years old now, and he's still working on me. Bless God, I'm glad that he is. Amen. And listen to me. The following Monday, I had a teacher to look at me, and this is what she said. She said, Danny, there's something different about you. 
And I said, what are you talking about? She said, there's something different about you. She said, you hadn't ever been this quiet in my class. And she says, there is a glow about you that I've never noticed before. What's happened to you? And a tear started running down my face. I said, I got saved. You want me to tell you what she said? That's exactly what she said. Glory to God. But I didn't really appreciate the next words out of her mouth. She said, I know for sure now there is a God. <laughs> Take off if He can save you, Danny Ray. He can save anybody. <laughs> But there's a change of conduct. Old things pass away. Behold, all things get to be new. And not only is there a change of conduct, but there's a change of action. Now what are you talking about, preacher? Well, I got a new vocabulary. Some of the words that used to come out of my mouth didn't come out anymore because God gave me a new tongue. And I began to talk to the Lord. And then something happened. My pastor, Ralph Hobbs, walked up to me about a month after he baptized me and he said, Danny, he said, you're going to be a preacher. And I won't ever forget what I said to Brother Ralph. I said, Brother Ralph, I love you, but you crazy. You've lost your mind. I'm too shy to be a preacher. And I was a shy boy. Wouldn't know it now, but I was. I really was. And then God brought back to my memory a little green Bible story book, and I wish I still had that Bible story book, that my great-granddaddy, a man by the name of J.B. Young, my great-granddaddy, had given me. God brought back to my memory how I used to turn an old wooden high chair around and lay that green Bible story book down on that, that little high chair and it was my pulpit and I used to preach to my mama and my daddy from that high chair. Never dreamed that God would call me to preach but he did. And Brother Ralph Hobbs was there when I was ordained. And I won't ever forget what he leaned down and whispered into my ear before he laid his hands on me. I'm not as crazy as you thought I was, am I, boy? <laughs> you see, God changed my attitude, changed my conduct, gave me a prayer life, and then gave me a heart to worship. I love to worship the Lord. This morning I was sitting in front of my little computer after I got through with my devotional stuff and I ran across an old song that Brooks and Dunn, a country duo, composed many years ago. And the title of the song was I Believe. Anybody ever heard it? Oh, yeah. If you hadn't heard it, you need to listen to it. The story goes that when he was a little boy, he went to this old man's house. And the old man talked to him about the letters that was written in red. And I sat there and tears started running down my face. You see, I had my worship service before I got here this morning. And it was good. It was good. The third thing that I want you to see is this. Godly direction. 
Let's talk about its direction. First of all, to have godly direction, there's got to be a doctrine. You see, all belief must take Him into account. If your belief system doesn't take God into account, then you can't live godly. And listen, all we can know uh, about God is found in the Scripture. The Bible says what it means means what it says. And then you've got to practice godly living by following directions. Godly consciousness shows in our actions. Your actions will always speak louder than your words. Amen. Please remember that. Please remember that. You know, so many times we have to deal with individuals and People are going to always be people and, and there's going to be conflict and there's going to be getting crossed up. And well, How do I handle all that? Let your actions handle it for you. Jesus met people in the midst of their conflicts and loved them through the conflict. And people saw Christ in their lives. In His life because He was the Christ. But listen, you be like Him. And let others see Jesus in you. So practice it. Practice following His direction. And then the last thing that I want you to see is godly demands. Now there's a negative side of this. Now preacher, what are you talking about? Well, there's going to be satanic pull. Once you get saved by the grace of God, the devil can't ever have you anymore. But let me tell you something. He can try his best to pull you away from godly living. He can try his best to pull you away from what you ought to be. And that's why it's so important for you to have a godly consciousness. Because the devil is a real devil. And so as Satan tries to do this, another negative thing is Satan will try to persuade you to turn back to the old lifestyle and do those things that's displeasing to God. Don't do it. But then there's the positive side of this. And the positive side of godly living should motivate us uh, to do right with great encouragement. That it's worthwhile to serve the Lord. It is. It's worthwhile to serve the Lord. Listen, the positive side of this thing should motivate us to a steadfast endurance. Now, you want me to tell you what that means? It means I'm going to keep on keeping on no matter what. Godly consciousness will enable me to keep going even when the going gets rough and tough. And listen to me. The going is going to get rough and tough because Jesus said, In this world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. It should motivate us to increase in knowledge. How do I increase in knowledge? Pick up the book. But preacher, you don't understand. I don't like to read. I don't like to watch or pick up books and read. I like to watch television. God has so graciously made readily available to us so many resources today that we don't necessarily have to read. We can mash a button on a smartphone and it'll read the Bible to us and all we have to do is listen to it you can go buy a set of DVDs and watch it on television for those who like to watch television you can go buy a set of CDs and listen to it as you're driving along the highway God has made everything so easy for us.
But yet statistics prove that the Bible, while it may be the best-selling book in the history of the world, it's the most neglected book in the history of the world. To gain knowledge of God, we've got to pick up the book and read the book. And listen, if we want to know more about Jesus, then everything about Him is in the book. Read the book. I'll close this with the thoughts of Paul. Paul said this in 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. He said, but godliness... But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, what do I want you to do? Go out into your world. Smile. Smile. Let others see Jesus in you. For it might be your godly living that points them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand with me. Father, your message and pray you'll have your way in it for Christ's sake. Amen.